Hi there, my fellow mainframers and computer performance analysts. Today we are going to complete our analysis and tuning exercise for the CP enable parameter of the IEA OPT member of PalmLive. This video is part two of a two part series. Now make sure you check out part one to learn more about this parameter and how it works. In this video, I'm going to show you what measurements you need to analyze when evaluating this parameter, and I will also give you some tuning recommendations. So get ready to once again roll up your sleeves and get some work done. Hi there, my name is Peter Enrico of Enterprise Performance Strategies. My team and I are here to help you get great workload performance while optimizing the usage of your system resources in the mainframe environment. Our education and our Pivotus software are geared towards helping you get better performance results and faster. We created the Mainframe Performance Channel to teach you how to do what we do. Now if you're new here, click that subscribe button and any of the references I give in this video, I'll be sure to link in the references below. So as I said, today I want to complete taking you through an analysis and tuning exercise of the CP enable parameter of the ZOS Mainframe Operating System. This parameter is specified in the IEA OPT member of PalmLive, and once again, this video is part two of a two-part series. In part one, I laid out the four steps to conduct this analysis, and as a reminder, the four steps are, step one, learn about the CP enable parameter, Step two, learn your current CP enable parameter settings. Step three, learn the measurements needed to complete an analysis of the CP enable parameter settings. And finally, step four, uh, tune the CP enable parameter. Part one of this video series covered steps one and two, and during this video, I will cover steps three and four. I also want to remind you that this is a ZOS operating system parameter, so remember that this analysis exercise needs to be done for each one of your mainframe environments. Now, let's get to it. For step three, I want to tell you about the key measurements you need to examine when analyzing the CP enable parameter. The key measurements of interest are from the SMF Type 70 record, and the two raw measurement fields from this record are as follows. The first field is named SMF70 SLH, and this measurement contains the number of I.O. interruptions that each processor handled by entry into the I.O. interrupt handler. The second field has the name of SMF70 TPI, and this measurement is the number of I.O. interruptions that each processor handled, but from issuing the TPI instruction. As a reminder, TPI is an acronym for Test pending interrupt. Okay, so these are the raw data fields, but how can they be used to and, re and reported to evaluate the CP enable parameter? Uh, performance reporters and SMF reporting products such as our Pivotor uses these measurements along with the interval time in formulas to derive two key other measurements needed to evaluate the CP enable parameter setting. The first derived measurement is the IO interrupt rate which is the total rate per second that each logical processor handled I.O. interrupts. The formula for I.O. interrupt rate is listed here. Basically, the formula is the total I.O. interrupts divided by the number of seconds in the measurement interval to give us the I.O. interrupt rate. The second derived measurement is the percentage of total interrupts handled by the test pending interrupt. The formula for this measurement is the total I.O. interrupts handled from issuing the TPI instruction as a percentage of all the I.O. interrupts, and that formula is listed here. Okay, this is all well and good, but how do you read these measurements? So to do that, let's take a look at some of our Pivotor reports. Okay, so we're going to look at some reports, and the first report I want to show you is, is shown here, and this is the I.O. interrupt rate per logical processor. So on the x-axis we have the date and time and on the y-axis we have the I.O. interrupt rate and for a series we have each logical processor. So what you're looking at here is the I.O. interrupt rate for each of these logical processors. What I want to bring your attention to is when you look at it on an, uh, a logical processor basis, notice that some logical processors, in this case I'm doing the flyover, I see that logical processor 8 handles most of the I.O. interrupts. 
Occasionally, another logical processor gets enabled. That's a uh, logical processor six as the I.O. rate changes throughout the day. And then you can see down here on the x-axis or closer to the x-axis, occasionally have other logical processors enabled for I.O. interrupts. The point is, few logical processors are enabled for I.O. interrupts. And then as the uh, I.O. rate goes up, the number of I.O. process, uh, the number of logical processors enabled for I.O. interrupts is going up as well. The next report is for the same period of time, but what I want to bring your attention to is as follows. The column charts here, the blue area, is the I.O. interrupt rate for all logical processors put together, where on the previous chart it was broken down by logical processor. So this is the total I.O. interrupt rate for this ZOS partition. The second measurement I want to bring your attention to is this line down here, which is the number of logical processors enabled for I.O. interrupts. And we see here it's a constant 7. What that means is on a regular basis, this partition had a constant of 7 logical processors enabled for I.O. interrupts. And the third measurement here is the percentage of I.O. interrupts handled by TPI, and that's the key measurement we need to pay attention to when tuning the CP enable parameter. In this particular case, we see that the percentage of I.O. interrupts handled through TPI hovers anywhere between about 10% uh, to about 25%. I do want to point out that this is a 15-minute average and that uh, CP enabled and, and the system make decisions about enabling and disabling on a much more granular basis. So remember, we have times when, this, when the uh, percentage of uh, IOs handled by TPI is much higher than even 30% and sometimes much lower. And that's a key point because our threshold value that we talked about for CP enabled during this period of time, I can tell you, is 10 comma 30, and that's why we want this uh, orange line to kind of be between those two lines to influence the enablement and disablement of a logical processor to enable IO, uh, to be handling I.O. interrupts. The next report listed here is for a longer period of time, and on the left-hand side of this chart is the day we just looked at. So this is what we looked at on the previous chart, which was the March 27th date. Now notice on this particular report, we're looking at the number of, the, uh, the number of I.O. interrupts uh, handled by each logical processor. And we see on the left-hand side, we have uh, quite a few number of logical processors, R7 in this example, handling I.O. interrupts. And then something happens, all of a sudden it goes to just one CPU. And this is an important point I want you to pay attention to when we talk later in this video. In this particular case, what was the event that happened that caused it only to be one CPU? This particular customer migrated from a Z13 processor to a Z14 processor, which handles the I.O. interrupts and the enablement of CPUs differently. This is an important point. So if I look at the same period of time for this migration, on the left-hand side here, we're looking at the Z13 uh, uh, generation processor where we have the I.O. interrupt rate, the constant 7 CPUs enabled for I.O. interrupts, and we see the TPI values hovering between, let's say, 15 and 25. All of a sudden, when we go to the Z14 uh, processor, notice that the constant number of I, uh, CPUs enabled for I.O. interrupts is down to 1. The I.O. interrupt is about the same, maybe a little bit less. But notice that the percentage of IOs handled, interrupts handled by TPI, it goes way down as well. And that's an important point for tuning because this number goes down, our threshold values of 10 comma 30 will be out of date because now we're looking at much lower values. And because they are much lower values of the TPI, percentage per TPI, TPI that's the reason we only have the one CPU enabled for IO interrupts. So remember this example, remember these pivotal reports, because now I'm going to talk about what is going on here and what tuning you need to do. As we just saw in this example, when this system is migrated from a Z13 processor to a Z14 processor, the number of logical processors enabled for I.O. interrupts went way down. Why did this happen? Previous to the Z14 generation processors, all logical processors in what's called a no work wait were enabled for I.O. interrupts with most of the I.O.s being handled by just a few logical processors. And this is why we usually saw multiple logical processors handling I.O. interrupts.
as of the Z14 in later generations, the proper number of processors enabled for I.O. interrupts is now determined by the ZOS Workload Manager. According to an IBM flash listed in the references, changes were made to limit the impact of hyper-dispatch vertical high and vertical medium pool processors in a no-work weight from being dispatched to a physical engine just to handle an I.O. interrupt. And this is one of the reasons why we see fewer logical processors enabled for I.O. interrupts. As a side note, all a no work weight means is that the ZOS system had no work for a logical processor, and when this happens, Prism takes the physical processor away from the logical processor for this partition. It is these logical processors in a no work weight that are less likely to be enabled for I.O. interrupts. A common question we are, we are asked is, would it not be better for, Z, uh, for a ZOS logical processor with nothing to do and in a no work weight to handle the IO interrupt? And the answer is no, because to handle the IO interrupt, Prism needs to dispatch a physical processor to the logical processor, and it's very likely that that physical processor is being used by another ZOS partition. On, ZO, uh, on Z14 and higher generation machines, this may mean that fewer logical processors configured to a ZOS partition may be allowed to handle I.O. interrupts and that the I.O.s might be delayed a bit. One special case you need to be careful of is when only one CPU is enabled for I.O. interrupts. According to IBM, there have been reports that when only one processor is enabled for I.O. interrupts, and that logical processor is, disabled, is in a disabled state or running a CPU intensive unit of work that the IOs can get backed up or even time out waiting for a channel. And this is where tuning comes in. This now brings us to step four of this analysis and tuning exercise. As a reminder, step four is tuning the CP enable parameter. The Z13 to Z14 example that we saw is typical of many installations when they migrate to processors above the Z13 generation machines. Many times the number of logical processors enabled for IO interrupts drops to just one. This is why the CP enable parameter thresholds need to be tuned downward. The reason for the lower thresholds is to increase the likeliness that the logical processors will be enabled for IO interrupts. What should you set it to? Not to overly complicate things, but the specific range of considerations published by IBM are as follows. CP enable 0, 0,0 if you're running a low endway ZOS system or if the workloads on that ZOS system have very low I.O. rates. Why is that? Well, if a system is a low endway, say like a two logical processor uh, ZOS image, then it might help to have both enabled for I.O. interrupts so the I.O. delays are less likely. CP enable on very high N-way uh, systems or a system with very high I.O. rates, uh, you can probably keep the CP enable parameter set to 10 comma 30. But for the typical system, you probably want to set the CP enable parameter to 5 comma 15. The lower CP enable thresholds allow the system to be more sensitive to enabling CPUs for I.O. interrupts and less sens sensitive for disabling CPU for I.O. interrupts. Now, I do want to put forth a fourth uh, possible uh, a setting um, out there for you to consider. You may want to have the high threshold value be 15 but I also want you to think about sometimes it may be helpful for the low threshold value to be something lower than five, say three. Why? Because if a uh, five comma 15 setting still leaves you with w only one logical processor enabled, it sometimes um, it would help to have two. The setting, setting the lower threshold to a lower, something of value of like three or lower decreases the probability that a second enabled CPU will be disabled for a long period of time. This is a loose recommendation. Uh, in all likeliness, 5 comma 15 should be okay. Uh, I just sometimes feel better when there is a second logical processor enabled to help with the I.O. interrupts. Well, that's my tuning recommendations and that's it from me.
Peter Enrico wanting to thank you, my fellow mainframers and computer performance analysts. I hope you learned something during this video and I would love to hear your thoughts about the CP Enable parameter and your results. So feel free to leave a comment below or send me an email to let me know your results when tuning this parameter. I want to thank you, my fellow mainframers and computer performance analysts, and I'll see you during our next tuning and analysis exercise. Thank you. <laughs>